We've already done a video looking back at when Formula One teams successfully invaded IndyCar and changed American motorsport, but it's not all one-way traffic. We promised this video, so here it is. A short view back to the past on where IndyCar conquered F1. Gentlemen, a short view back to the past. When the F1 World Championship was inaugurated in 1950, the Indianapolis 500 was included in the calendar to give it an international feel. In fact, it was on the schedule for a whole decade, but very few F1 teams made the trip and none of the IndyCar teams bothered with F1. Nevertheless, key figures at Monza got together with the US Automobile Club, which then ran IndyCar, to hatch a plan for a very special race. The idea was to use the 2.6 mile banked oval at Monza, so not the part of the Grand Prix track, but just the oval, to have three heats, each of 63 laps, to a total of 500 miles to attract the best of IndyCar and F1 teams. Now the rules were for IndyCars, so that's 4.2 litre unsupercharged and 2.8 litre supercharged, so not really a match for Formula 1. So they knew that the Formula 1 teams would need to have different machinery if they were to be competitive. Perhaps unsurprisingly, not many teams on either side were ready for the first event in 1957. Jean Beira was the leading European contender with his Maserati 250F, but problems in practice meant that he didn't even start. The International Union for Professional Drivers, which had only recently been formed, kind of like the GPDA of its day, also requested a boycott. So very few of the European drivers wanted to go due to the high speed nature of the circuit and the possibility of tyre failures. All that meant that the only European representation at the 1957 race was three Ikurikos Jaguar D-types. They were fresh from winning the Le Mans 24 hours and acquitted themselves very well. As lots of the Indy cars failed, the Jaguars kept pounding round and round and round and finished fourth, fifth and sixth. But of course on pace, they were no match for the Indy Roadsters and Jimmy Bryan won two of the heats and finished second in the other to take a comfortable aggregate victory. Both sides were better prepared for the 1958 edition. And the drivers also didn't seem to be talking about the safety anymore, perhaps something to do with the impressive prize money on offer. The leading European entries were the Eldorado Special, a Maserati with a 4.2 litre version of the 450S sports car V8 engine to be driven by Sterling Moss. There was also a 4.2 litre Ferrari, which was loosely based on the 375 that had been part of the previous Formula 1 regulations just after the war. As an aside, the Automobile Club of Milan also tried to get hold of two BRM V16s, but BRM were already focusing on their 2.5 litre Formula 1 project. The thought of those two V16s screaming around Monza, I think, would have really been something to behold. One Manuel Fangio was also present, and he was there to drive the Dean Van Line Special that had won the year before. He actually qualified third, and remember, he's getting towards the end of his illustrious career, but sadly, he wasn't able to start the first two heats due to a cracked piston. He then had a fuel pump failure early in heat three, so it was a bit of an anticlimax for the five-time world champion. The grid was set by the three fastest laps of each car, and sensationally, Luigi Musso actually topped qualifying with the 4.2-litre Ferrari. Probably worth pointing out at this stage, the average speed of those qualifying laps was around 175 miles an hour. So you think about that, no safety, no seat belts even, skinny tyres on the banking. Crazy, crazy stuff that we can't really imagine today. That was also a lot faster than the times that the cars were doing in the Indianapolis 500 during the 1950s. So this really was a step into the unknown for all the drivers. Musso upheld European honour very well. He had a better gearbox for getting away from the line. Actually led comfortably at the start, but he was soon sucked in by the three fastest Indy cars. He was part of a four-way battle with Eddie Sachs, Jimmy Bryan and Jim Rathman. Sachs's engine failed and Rathman had moved to the front when the gallant Musso finally came into the pits having been overcome by exhaust fumes and Mike Hawthorne jumped in the car instead. He couldn't make up the lost ground and Rathman took the heat victory with the top European runner being Sterling Moss in the El Dorado Maserati in fourth place. Both Moss and Musso were involved in a fantastic scrap for second in the second heat. Sadly, Musso had to come in again due to the fumes and hand over to Phil Hill this time while Moss's Maserati engine went off song. Rathman won easily to make it two wins out of two. He made it a hat-trick in the final heat to take the aggregate victory, while Moss survived a scary spin where the steering failed on his Maserati, putting him in the wall. He somehow maintained control and escaped serious injury. The Ferrari finished third in the final heat, not disgracing itself at all, but there was no doubt about the overall winner. Rathman and the Zinc Special had won all three heats and took the aggregate victory by over a minute. Jimmy Bryan was second and he won the Two Worlds Trophy, which was judged over the two best results from the Indy 500 and this Monza 500. 
Now perhaps the most remarkable thing about this story is the average speed. Rathman's average speed for winning across the three heats was 166.7 miles an hour. Now that puts it some way ahead of the fastest Formula One race of all time, even now, which is the 2003 Italian Grand Prix that Michael Schumacher won at a pathetic 153.8 miles an hour. Despite a much better second event and some proper European competition, the Automobile Club of Milan couldn't make a profit and the race was never held again. So F1 teams never got that opportunity to take revenge, at least not at Monza, and IndyCar won the day. If you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe, and do let us know if there are any other stories you'd like us to take a look at in future. And also take a look at Motorsport TV for some other great motorsport videos.